Hi, it's Katrina. God Icon All over the world, there is a religious god icon that can be found at dozens and dozens of ruins. This icon looks basically identical from Egypt to South America, from the Celts to the ancient Greeks, from the Persians to the Assyrians, and many more. The icon is always found in the center of doorways and archways, usually etched in stone at the peak of temple doors. The icon can either be male or female, and sometimes it even looks like a monster. But there is no mistaking how similar they all are, with the way that their arms are outstretched and the fact that they are always in the exact same position, holding something in their hands. But what could this all mean? We know it has something to do with religion and that it has to do with perfect symmetry. Each religious icon has arms outstretched in opposite directions, and they are always holding twin objects, being perfectly symmetrical. Richard Cassaro has gone in depth in the subject and proposes that the world's first culture shared the same religious icon, and that it is the symbol of a forgotten Golden Age religion that was shared around the world. The discovery of all these icons suggests that the ancient cultures of our world were more familiar with each other than we give them credit for. How is it possible for cultures that have never met to have the same religious icon and carve it in the same sacred places above entrances of religious or spiritual places? Of course, we have no idea how ancient cultures could have been in contact with one another or how they became inspired to create the same things. But the theory is that as humans evolved and religion began, those early people continued the same tradition as they spread and migrated throughout the world. What do you think could explain these similarities? Let me know in the comments below. The Three Geniuses It's always a great big coincidence whenever you meet a person who shares the same birthday as you. But what about three geniuses entwined in a life and death cycle on the exact same dates? It began on January 8, 1642, when Galileo Galilei died. Galileo was a brilliant Italian astronomer who discovered four of the largest moons of Jupiter, craters and mountains on the moon, and he was fairly certain that the Earth was not actually the center of the universe, which got him in major hot water with the church. Exactly 300 years after Galileo died, Stephen Hawking was born. That would be January 8, 1942. Stephen Hawking contributed a significant amount of scientific knowledge to our world as well, even changing the way we understand how the universe works and how gravity and black holes function. Stephen Hawking died on March 14, 2018. Albert Einstein was born on March 14, 1879, making this birth coincide with the date of death of Stephen Hawking. The birth and death of Stephen Hawking coinciding with Albert Einstein and Galileo makes this an absolutely outrageous coincidence that's almost enough to make a person believe in reincarnation. Even more bizarre is that both Hawking and Einstein lived to be 76 years old. Whether there is some cosmic connection between these three men, or it's just the greatest birthday slash death coincidence ever, we will never know. The Curse of Timur Timur was a conqueror from 1336 to 1405. He was a Turco-Mongol warrior who founded the Timurid Empire, a once prosperous and bloody empire throughout Persia and Central Asia. He completed a lot and conquered more than most ancient rulers of the world. He tried to restore the Yuan Dynasty in China, he controlled much of the remains of the great Genghis Khan's shattered empire, and he allegedly killed about 17 million people through conquest, or about 5% of the population. It was in 1941, over 600 years after Timur's death, that the Russians decided to open his tomb. An expedition of archaeologists set out to Samarkand to finally open the tomb of the legendary emperor. But not everyone was on board. Locals feared there was a curse attached to his tomb. The curse stated that anyone who tried to open the tomb would bring great destruction down upon their nation. Of course, archaeologists never heed warnings like this, otherwise they would probably never excavate anything. On June 20th, the tomb was opened. When they pried the lid off, a horrible stench filled the mausoleum, unlike when Egyptian mummies are unveiled, which apparently usually smell sweet. And then, two days after Timur's tomb was opened, on June 22, 1941, the Nazi Germans invaded the Soviet Union without ever declaring a war and went on to kill millions of people. Some claim it happened because Timur's tomb was opened, making it one of the strangest historical coincidences involving an ancient curse. Alien Cave Art Thousands of years ago on the Colorado Plateau, ancient people painted images of beings from other worlds and maybe even other dimensions. 
This Native American artwork was left behind on rock panels all throughout the Southwest, with the oldest being the Barrier Canyon pictographs. According to the National Endowment for the Humanities, some of these paintings could be up to 9,000 years old, with many confirmed to be at least 5,000 years old. Some of the images painted here are animals and other seemingly ordinary creatures, but some are large, human-like beings with no arms or legs and giant eyeballs. They are most likely different deities or attempts to represent spirits. The paintings are made of red ochre, and some by our standards are a bit scary. But what religion doesn't have a terrifying being? Of course, some people claim they represent visitors from another planet. But here's what's so strange. There has also been mysterious rock art discovered in Siberia that dates back to around the same time, 5,000 years ago, and shows the same type of alien-like creatures, possibly even interdimensional travelers. To this day, the connection between the two prehistoric sites has evaded scientists. Nobody can figure out how people from before the dawn of civilization could have possibly found inspiration in each other to create such similar artwork. What some people say is that the only logical explanation is that prehistoric humans from all over the world really did witness beings from beyond our planet and drew them on the rocks. The Gorgons Most people have heard of Medusa. She is a popular figure in Greek mythology who was once a beautiful woman who was turned into a hideously ugly monster with a hairdo full of snakes, known as the Gorgon. There is arguably no snake woman quite as popular as Medusa, but across the world in Mesoamerica, there was another snake woman monster goddess oddly similar to Medusa. This figure is Coatlicue, and she comes from the Aztec culture, who worshipped her as one of their gods who gave birth to the moon and the stars. Both Medusa and Coatlicue could technically be considered gorgons. They have both been depicted as humanoid creatures with many serpents coming out of them. In Aztec culture, Coatlicue was seen as a woman who wore a skirt of snakes. Unlike Medusa having a head of snakes, Coatlicue wore them as a living skirt. But the similarities are there nonetheless, making you wonder where the inspiration for all these snake women came from. Edgar Allan Poe, Future Teller Edgar Allan Poe published a story of a shipwreck in 1839. It was called The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket, and it was the only complete novel ever written by the famous poet. In the book, the narrator describes a horrifying tale of disaster on the high seas. The main character is a stowaway on his father's whaling ship. There's a mutiny, a large storm, and the main character becomes stuck below deck with a friend and two others, Dirk Peters and Richard Parker. After suffering from hunger and eating nothing but a bit of old turtle meat, they realize it's time to sacrifice one of the group for the sake of the rest. It ends up being Richard Parker who's sacrificed to be eaten by the few remaining crew members. After the book was published, it was a complete failure. Critics hated it because it was too violent and too inaccurate. Poe himself had to come out and agree that it was a very silly book. It wasn't until much later that it became a cult classic. Jules Verne even published a sequel in 1897. But here's the terrifying coincidence. In 1884, a yacht left England en route to Australia. It was called the Mignonette, and it wasn't prepared to make such a huge trip. It sank in a storm, four men escaped in a lifeboat, and they survived by eating turtle meat. This was very similar to Poe's story. Another similar aspect is that on the ship was a man named Richard Parker, the same name of the guy who gets eaten in Poe's novel. He was ultimately killed and eaten by the others in the lifeboat, who even cut him open and drank his blood while it was still fresh and warm. As you can see, the coincidence here is remarkable. Either Poe could see into the future, or his imagination was so powerful that his story actually came true in real life. Amazonian Sumerians Back in 1927, the Italian priest Carlo Crespi descended into the Amazon jungle in Ecuador, who over the next decade allowed him to discover many amazing archaeological pieces throughout the region. Some of the amazing finds made by Carlo have stunned scientists to this very day. He discovered tablets covered in what appeared to be hieroglyphics. Nobody has ever been able to decipher these hieroglyphics. And then, in 1962, the museum where many of the relics were held apparently caught fire and some of the precious artifacts were lost. But here's where the coincidences come in. Carlo was convinced that the Sumerians had actually visited the Amazon jungle thousands of years before and had contact with primitive civilizations there. This would be a direct connection between the Middle East and the Amazon far before the New World was ever even discovered. 
Many of the relics found by Carlo looked identical to artifacts discovered by modern archaeologists in ancient Sumeria. It is hard to understand if this is all true, but until more evidence is found, it remains an obscure idea. The Beginning and the End of the Civil War On April 9, 1865, General Robert E. Lee and Colonel Charles Marshall met at the house of Wilmer McLean. They were Confederate officers. It wasn't long after they showed up at the house that General Ulysses S. Grant arrived with his party of Union officers, including Captain Robert Todd Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's son. And there, in the parlor of Wilmer McLean's house, the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia surrendered and the Civil War was over. Wilmer himself had been too old to fight when the war began. For its majority, he had been a simple merchant buying and selling sugar. The four years before the defeat of the Confederacy, the First Battle of Manassas, also known as Bull Run, had actually been fought in Wilmer's very own backyard. It was the first battle of the Civil War. And so, by some strange twist of fate, or perhaps coincidence, the Civil War actually started in Wilmer McLean's backyard in the year 1861 and came to an abrupt end inside his parlor four years later in 1865. Flying Serpents Ancient Egyptians and ancient Mesoamericans never met, and yet somehow they both had an obsession with flying serpent deities. They both built pyramids, often in rows of three aligning with important stars in the sky, and they both developed impressive calendars. The cultural similarities between the two ancient civilizations is hard to ignore. For example, the Aztec culture worshipped Quetzalcoatl, a feathered snake god from between the years 1200 BC to 1521 when the Spanish came and basically bulldozed them and their religion to the ground. Before this, from 3000 BC and onwards, the Egyptians worshipped the goddess of the pharaohs Isis, whom they often depicted as being a feathered serpent. In other words, both gods were flying serpents covered in feathers. They looked identical, but nobody from either civilization ever made it across the ocean to see the other, making historians wonder why they had chosen to worship the exact same god. Some have suggested the feathered serpent may have been a real creature witnessed by both cultures. Even before the Aztecs, the earlier civilization of the Olmec were creating sculptures of jaguar-human hybrids that looked an awful lot like Egyptian sphinxes. Could these have been real creatures that had come and gone with no physical trace of them left behind? In any case, both of these cultures were fascinated by this depiction of a flying snake bird god. Twain and the Comet Samuel Longhorn Clemens, known to most people by his pen name Mark Twain, lived a very strange life of coincidences. He had what you might call a cosmic relationship with Halley's Comet, the most famous comet to ever grace our planet. The comet was first recorded in 239 AD, then officially named by astronomer Edmund Halley after learning of the same comet witnessed in 1531, 1607, and 1682. Before his death, he predicted the comet would return in 1758. And it did. And then it returned again in 1835, just as Mark Twain was being born. What makes this coincidence the strangest is that the famous author admitted his connection with the comet. He was utterly aware of it and was once quoted as saying, I came in with Halley's Comet and I expect to go out with it. And that's exactly what happened. When Mark Twain died of a heart attack on April 21, 1910, the comet just so happened to arrive back at Earth for the first time in 75 years wrapping Mark Twain's life up in a neat little package of coincidence. Of course, there is no secret meaning or cosmic truth behind Mark Twain and Halley's Comet. It's just a curious element of fate. Football Fish In May of this year, a jet black, football-shaped fish with dozens of razor-sharp teeth washed ashore on California's Newport Beach. A beachgoer was out for a walk when they discovered the terrifying fish. It was an 18-inch long, wide-mouthed Pacific football fish normally found thousands of feet deep in the ocean. It's quite rare and extremely unusual for humans to see an anglerfish in real life, let alone a Pacific football fish, which lives at extreme depths of more than 3,000 feet below the water's surface. Finding one stranded on the beach is quite the surprise. There are over 200 species of anglerfish that we have identified, with most of them living in complete darkness under extreme pressure where food is scarce. Anglerfish are ambush predators that are known for the bioluminescent bulb hanging over their head like a lure. The light in the dark attracts prey that come to see what's going on. As soon as they get close, 
the angler will open its large mouth and quickly swallow prey up to its own size. Its sharp glass-like teeth and deep black color help them hide perfectly in the darkness. The victim won't even know what hit it. Only female anglerfish who grow as long as two feet have this feature. Males are many times smaller, only reaching up to an inch long. Male anglerfish exist solely to procreate and are sexual parasites. They latch onto the female's body and will fuse to her and dissolve over time until all that's left are their reproductive organs, which the female can use to reproduce at any time. Nobody knows how the Pacific football fish ended up on the beach. It's entirely unheard of. And while the creature looks like something out of a nightmare or a horror movie, for scientists, it's a rare treat that is helping them to study a species they hardly ever get to see. Reappearing Ghost Shipwrecks Nicknamed the Graveyard of the Atlantic, the North Carolina coast is home to hundreds of shipwrecks, many which appear and disappear as the sands shift. Shipwrecks are constantly covered and rediscovered again and again over the years. Two years ago, the Cape Hatteras National Seashore posted a picture revealing the creepy skeleton of a nearly 100-year-old shipwreck that was exposed by the beach's shifting sands. Named the George A. Kohler, the four-masted boat became stranded on Hatteras Island in August 1933 while en route to Haiti. High winds from a passing hurricane forced it to run aground. The crew remained stranded on the ship until the storm passed, but luckily the ship held together through the storm and they were eventually rescued. But the ship remained stranded for the next decade, and islanders were paid to salvage what they could from it. The vessel was burned during World War II for some of its iron fittings, leaving the skeleton that remains in place today that occasionally emerges from the ground. Even experienced sailors struggled to navigate the choppy coastal waters of Cape Hatteras. The George A. Kohler was one of the last known ships to crash along its shore. Deceptive Dummy while cleaning the intercoastal beach at Perdido Key along the Florida Panhandle with the nonprofit organization Ocean Hour earlier this year, a volunteer named Kathleen spotted what she initially thought was a decapitated corpse. It was covered in seaweed and barnacles, and the sight was so convincing, another witness dialed 911. While they waited for the police, Kathleen gathered the courage to take a closer look, and much to her and everybody else's relief, the body turned out to be a mannequin. That's good, but it makes sense why at first glance it resembled a headless dead body. Nobody knows how the mannequin ended up on the beach, but it likely spent a very long time in the water to become fully encrusted in sea life, according to a Facebook post by Ocean Hour, which added that its volunteers and employees were glad the discovery did not turn out to be a human after all. Mystery Species Scientists were stumped earlier this year when they were unable to identify a creature that washed ashore in the Gulf of Mexico at Florida's Cayo Costa State Park. Cape Coral resident Ivan Cesar spotted a skull and vertebrae on the beach and took some pictures. Experts couldn't figure out what creature the bones belonged to. All they can say with certainty is that the fish came from the ocean. They believe it may be a deep-dwelling species and possibly a victim of red tide a phenomenon when algal blooms turn the water red and suck up all the oxygen, basically suffocating all the sea creatures while releasing toxins into the ocean. It wasn't a shark because their skeletons are made from cartilage, which doesn't last for long and usually causes them to sink when they die. It's interesting because just days earlier, an invasive Amazonian monster fish known as the Arapaima was seen on the shore of the Caloosahatchee River, which is also in Florida. These beasts can grow up to 10 feet long and weigh as much as 200 pounds. It's possible this fish was released into the wild by someone, or it means the powerful strong fish is spreading north. In any case, the more recent mystery monster measured five and a half feet long. A woman who also saw it says it was bigger than her seven-year-old child. It was white with a pinkish tail and had a gaping mouth. The presence of a South American species in Florida, which already has its fair share of invasive animals, was concerning for wildlife officials. Are new sea monsters spreading? Are they going to take over? In any case, if you are in Florida and see something weird, definitely report it to the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. They are on the lookout to prevent crazy, powerful, strong creatures from establishing in the state and threatening local wildlife. If you are new here, be sure to hit that subscribe button and join us! Dismembered Feet Since 2007, at least 21 detached human feet have washed ashore on the coast of the Salish Sea in British Columbia, Canada and Washington State in the United States. The discoveries baffled experts for a decade. 
Was this some sort of mafia thing? Coroners ruled out foul play and determined that the feet belonged to people who died by suicide or in accidents. The feet apparently detached naturally during the decomposition process, and because most were wearing sneakers, they were buoyant and shielded from decay, leaving them relatively intact by the time they appeared on the beach. They were also found many, many miles from where they initially entered the water, according to forensic pathologist Dr. Matthew Ord. This information may potentially help solve a tragic case in Australia. Late last year, businesswoman Melissa Caddick disappeared from her mansion in Sydney. Her severed foot was found hundreds of miles from her home several months later, on the Beach along the New South Wales coast. Investigators initially struggled to understand how the foot, clad in Miss Caddick's wedge shoe, could drift so far on its own. A senior investigator even went as far as saying the woman was probably on the run for several weeks before she died, based on the condition of the foot. This was when Dr. Ord stepped in and suggested an alternative theory, based on the findings in the case of detached feet in North America. Australian officials remained skeptical, pointing out that they'd never experienced a case of human remains traveling so far, and that more analysis was necessary to determine how long the shoe and foot were in the water. The circumstances around Caddick's disappearance and death remain a mystery, as detectives investigate claims that she swindled investors out of millions of dollars and fled to avoid facing accountability. Deerhead In 2015, beachgoers at Loyola Park Beach in Chicago were shocked to discover a partially decomposed severed deer's head on a stake next to Lake Michigan. The morbid display was covered in a red cloth bearing an image of a hand with five fingers and two thumbs and there was a symbol painted on the hand. Local resident Steve Brown discovered this strange sight during a morning walk and posted photos on social media in hopes of figuring out exactly what he was looking at and why someone would create such a creepy arrangement. Spiritual therapist and tarot card reader Elizabeth Ruiz said that the deer head might represent a Central American native warrior meant to fend off bad vibes and bad people and that the color red may symbolize power or fire. Regardless of its meaning, the severed deer head would not be on the beach for long, according to a Chicago Park District spokesperson who said that it was going to be removed immediately and that nothing like it had ever been seen before in the area. Eyeless Creature Visitors at a popular Mexican beach in the state of Jalisco known as Destiladeras were shocked in early 2020 when they found an eyeless, finless, dolphin-like creature with sharp teeth and an eel-like tail. Images of the disturbing creature went viral on social media, sparking a widespread frenzy to explain what exactly it was and why it looked the way it did. Locals speculated, based on the animal's lack of eyes, that it was a deep-dwelling species that lives in total darkness and has evolved to survive without eyesight. When interviewed by the media, no fishermen recognized the creature, but they did point out that nearby, in Puerto Vallarta, there is an area thousands of feet deep which could perhaps be the strange creature's home. While the bizarre being was never formally identified, social media users were quick to share their opinions, with one person suggesting that the carcass belonged to an eel of some sort that was puffed up from the decomposition process, making it look like a dolphin. Whatever the case, your guess is as good as mine. What do you think it was? Let me know in the comments below. Forgotten Railroad in late 2014, Shifting Sands exposed a set of long-forgotten rusting railroad tracks near the southern tip of New Jersey. These ghostly tracks are over 100 years old, and everyone was wondering where they came from. Built in 1905, the railroad was never used as a passenger line. For a time, the tracks were part of the Atlantic City Royal Route. Then they were used for transporting sand. Large cranes scooped sand off the beaches and into small boxcars which conveniently pulled right up to the waterline. Mined by the Cape May Sand Company, the sand was used in making glass and building projects. But local officials were worried that the continued mining of sand would deplete the beaches, and in 1936, they ended the company's operations there. The Harbison Walker Magnesite plant took over the site and used the tracks into the 1940s. But the area where these companies operated was ultimately abandoned and forgotten about until the tracks resurfaced in 2014, some 80 years after they were last used. A 50-foot stretch of track was re-exposed again in 2017, drawing photographers, tourists, and rail enthusiasts to the site during the off-season. 
The old railroad will likely surface at some time in the future due to the ever-shifting sands, but nobody knows exactly when that might happen. Montauk Monster Discovered in Montauk, New York in 2008, the Montauk Monster was a strange-looking animal carcass that nobody could identify. Photos of the creature went viral online, but did not necessarily get the world any closer to figuring out what it was. Because for one reason or another, someone allegedly decided to remove the corpse from the scene. To make things even weirder, a trio of guys reportedly admitted to taking the carcass and lighting it ablaze on the water, giving it what they called a Viking funeral. Responding to media requests to examine the images, zoologists said that the animal was likely a decomposing raccoon that had lost the bulk of its hair and skin, making it a pretty shocking scene. Others said it was a dog, maybe a pit bull. But not everyone was convinced. The photo of the bloated and rotting dead animal was traced back to Anna Holmes, the managing editor for Jezebel, who said that she received it from a marketing company, leading her to believe that it was an advertisement of some sort. The trail led to a Cartoon Network show called Cryptids Are Real. When questioned, a woman named Alana Nowitzki admitted to sending in the tip, but swore it was not part of a viral marketing campaign. And as it turned out, she was telling the truth. Numerous eyewitnesses reported seeing the creature firsthand, so it was a real discovery. There are other pictures out there of the creature as well. But was it really a raccoon or a dog? Maybe it was something else entirely. A live explosive. Jodie Cruz, a mom who lives in Kent, UK, and her eight-year-old daughter Isabella were stumped by a mystery object they found on the beach and originally thought it could be a fossil. They took it home and posted photos of it on fossil and archaeology sites, hoping that someone would know what it was. One social media user suggested that the item could be ambergris, or whale vomit, and told them to check by poking it with a hot pin to see if a white puff of smoke came out. Ambergris is extremely valuable, but this was not. They stuck the pin in and the object exploded into flames. They learned the hard way that it was a grenade. Miraculously, they weren't hurt. Isabella ran outside while Jody rushed to the kitchen sink where she doused the grenade and covered it with a wet towel in an effort to extinguish it. Neighbors sprang into action and called the fire brigade. The grenade damaged the windowsill and counter surrounding the sink and filled the home with smoke. Jody's friends, who were happy to help amid the chaos, have made her promise not to pick items up on the beach anymore. Ancient Phoenician Shipwreck Underwater archaeologists working with the University of Malta recently announced an amazing discovery. They found the remains of a spooky sunken merchant vessel from the days of the Phoenician Empire. This ship was discovered in the murky water near the island of Gozo in Malta. Who were the Phoenicians? They were the direct descendants of the ancient Canaanite people spoken of in the Bible. Today their descendants have been traced to people living in modern-day Syria and Lebanon. The Phoenicians excelled in maritime activities, meaning they had one of the highest levels of technology when it came to building ships anywhere in the ancient world. Phoenicians used galleys and even invented the Byreme, which is a galley with two decks of oars to be rowed even faster. The Phoenicians had a stable trading network all throughout the entire Mediterranean, including the nations of North Africa, Sicily, and Babylon between 1550 and 500 BC. The shipwreck just discovered came from around 700 BC and was located at a depth of about 375 feet. The ship sank about 200 years before the eventual decline of the Phoenicians. Scientists believe the vessel was going from Sicily to Malta at the time it was sunk. However, it's not exactly clear how the ship was sunk or what kind of interesting goods were being swapped between these two ancient nations. When did the Phoenicians arrive to Malta? So far, underwater archaeologists have discovered about 20 grinding stones which may have been used in blacksmith work. They also discovered 50 amphorae, which were ancient pottery containers used to hold a variety of different things. These were discovered scattered throughout the sand on the bottom of the sea floor, and are now homes for all kinds of sea creatures. Cave Skeleton The complete skeleton of a man has been found at the bottom of a cave in Spain. Found in the region of Navarra, his remains date back 11,700 years and could be the most important prehistoric discovery in the area. The skeleton has been dubbed the Man of Loisu, and he is one of the oldest ever found in Spain. The discovery was made far from the entrance to the cave back in 2017 by a group of cave explorers. Experts determined that the man appears to have been dumped in the cave on purpose. 
Thanks to carbon dating, scientists have learned the man was only between the ages of 17 and 21 when he was left in the darkness of the spooky cave. The skeleton is complete and well-preserved, but here's where things get violent. Researchers found a hole in the man's skull, suggestive of a projectile piercing his head prior to his death. They also believe the body had been wrapped in a shroud before being abandoned. Not only is the skeleton creepy because it's a skeleton, but the cave in which it was found is also pretty eerie and not very safe. Locals have known about the cave since ancient times, but nobody has ever explored it fully until just now. It's unclear why the guy was dumped into such an isolated place. There were no other bodies found inside the cave, so it was not a common burial place. Even though he was wrapped in a shroud and covered with ochre, it looks like he was murdered and then someone disposed of his body. Buddha in the Trash A statue dating back 1,500 years has been found in the trash. And not just any statue either. There were actually three sculptures of the sleeping Buddha found amidst piles of trash outside the National Museum in Karachi. But these weren't recent archaeological discoveries. Instead, they were recovered statues that had been previously stolen by smugglers. The statues were rescued and handed over to the museum. For some strange reason, the museum did not preserve them and clean them up like you might expect. They simply tossed them in the trash, creating a pretty creepy sight with the faces of the ancient Buddhas sticking out between ripped garbage bags. According to officials, the Buddhas were recovered along with 395 other artifacts when police foiled a smuggling operation during a routine patrol. From what professional historians can deduce, the object came from the old Gandhara civilization. Even more disturbing is that they weren't the only relics dumped in the garbage. There were other rare artifacts found piled up in heaps of trash outside the museum, including pieces of history from the ancient Indus Valley culture, which date from between 3300 BC and 1300 BC. These people developed standardized weights and measurements, they created sculptures and figures out of metal and stone, and the proof of their amazing accomplishments can currently be found in the garbage in India. But what the heck are they doing there? The National Museum director Mohammed Shah defended his department and said, We have put these sculptures over there ourselves. He claimed that since they were made of black schist stone that nothing would happen to them. Apparently they have run out of space inside the museum, so they decided to store everything in trash bags outside until they can build more room. Isn't this strange? What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Basilica of the Holy Blood when it comes to religious artifacts, there are many that are made up of strange body parts like bones and dried organs. The Basilica of the Holy Blood is home to one of the most sacred relics on the planet. The Basilica itself isn't creepy or an artifact. It's a chapel from the 12th century, located in the medieval Belgian town of Bruges. But it's what's housed inside of the chapel that's a little disturbing. The basilica holds a sacred vial which is said to contain a cloth stained with the very real blood of Jesus Christ. The chapel itself is quite extraordinary, but it's really the blood of Jesus that piques the public's interest. According to legend, after the crucifixion, Joseph of Arimathea wiped blood off Jesus' body using a cloth. That cloth was preserved and has been kept for the past 2,000 years. It was first kept inside a safe in the Holy Land before the King of Jerusalem, Baldwin III, handed it over to his brother during the Second Crusade. His brother, the Count of Flanders, Diedrich van de Elzas, then took the relic to Bruges, stored it in the Basilica, and it has remained unopened and in the Basilica to this very day. There are some who question the legitimacy of the blood. After all, anything said to be physical proof of Jesus is heavily controversial. However, there is a festival each year known as the Procession of the Holy Blood that brings thousands of tourists into the city as the Bishop of Bruges carries the vial through the streets. The first procession happened in 1291, and it is still happening over 720 years later. Decorated Skulls Archaeologists claim to have discovered human skulls that date back 9,500 years. These skulls were decorated in a very creepy fashion. They were modeled after real faces using clay, then colored to create disturbingly lifelike features. They were found inside of a burial site at a prehistoric village in modern Syria, near the capital of Damascus. Each skull was found inside the same pit, all of them resting in a pile. Even more ghoulish is that they were found underneath the remains of an infant, according to French archaeologist Danielle Storger. Unfortunately, we're not really sure what the ancient decorated skulls were used for. The realism is beyond impressive considering how old they are. 
They may have been someone's attempt at copying the faces of the dead, and they were almost certainly used in mysterious rituals. What makes them so unique is that archaeologists have never found anything else like them. These are completely unique in Syrian burials and everywhere else in the world, leading scientists to question just why they were made in the first place and why nobody ever tried to duplicate them. Creepy Figurines Some very mysterious Neolithic figurines have been discovered in Jordan. The figurines date back 10,000 years and were crafted by our Neolithic ancestors and placed in burials. This was a time when humans began expanding throughout the Middle East. However, very little in the way of archaeological artifacts have been found from this time. According to Juan José Ibáñez, who was working closely with the discovery, archaeologists found a unique assemblage of artifacts made from flint at the archaeological site of Karaisin. The artifacts appear to depict either humans or perhaps a god or goddess. They were discovered inside burials and apparently crafted specifically for mortuary rituals. And while it's undetermined whether these creepy figures were made to depict men or monster or otherworldly visitor, they are still pretty fascinating. Archaeologists say the figurines were cult objects. This means they were vehicles of a magic hand that would have only been used in ceremonies seen as highly symbolic or religious. Though what types of religion were practiced 10,000 years ago is still a mystery to historians and archaeologists. All we know is that the figures had something to do with the dead. The Black Obelisk the Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser III is a creepy artifact that looks like it belongs in the tomb of an ancient necromancer. Instead, it was originally built to celebrate the successful military campaigns of King Shalmaneser III of the Assyrian Empire. The obelisk was erected back in 825 BC in the courtyard of a central, possibly administrative building in the city of Kalu, also known as Nimrud. The obelisk is carved with four different scenes depicting various military achievements by the Assyrian king. On most of the sides, it shows various scenes of the king receiving tribute, though there is one side of the obelisk completely covered in pictures of strange animals. They seem to be humanoid in nature, almost like humans mixed with monkeys or apes. These bizarre animals are chained and kept on leashes, and scientists haven't quite figured out what the weird creatures could possibly be. As for the place in which the obelisk was found, it was once the capital city of the entire Assyrian Empire. Kalu was a prosperous city throughout much of the empire's significance until eventually it was ripped asunder by civil war and turned into a dusty ruin. Today this city is located in modern-day Iraq. 6,000-Year-Old Massacre A massacre that happened 6,000 years ago may have been one of the oldest instances ever of indiscriminate killing. The ancient site was found in Croatia, an archaeologist from the Institute for Anthropological Research in Croatia used genetic analysis to try and figure out just what happened for all these people to have been buried in such a ghoulish way. There were 41 people killed here and buried in a mass grave. The genetic study done was one of the largest ever in the history of archaeology. 38 out of the 41 individuals were analyzed for genetics. What researchers found is that they all belonged to the Lasinja culture from the Copper Age. The grave was filled with women and men in equal numbers, with about half being children and half being adults. Some of the people in the burial were related, others were simply part of the population, but they all shared common ancestry. The surprise here is that all the people were from the same place and the same culture. Normally in mass burials, the people slaughtered are part of a battle. It looks like here there was a large-scale killing that took place that had nothing to do with regular war could have happened because of an increase in population size and a scarcity of resources. There could have been a civil revolt. Scientists don't really know the answers. What they do know is that the people were slaughtered indiscriminately, regardless of age or gender, and then dumped inside of a pit and buried. Medieval Birthing Girdle One of the most dangerous things a woman could do throughout history and even today is give birth. Medieval medicine was a nightmare, and archaeologists have found one of the creepiest and most bizarre contraptions used by doctors about 500 years ago. It's called the birthing girdle, and it was found soaked in delivery fluid, milk, and honey. The girdle was used to help a woman survive childbirth. It was a length of parchment about 9 feet long that was wrapped around the swollen belly. How did this help? The parchment would be covered in prayers and religious symbols. The prayers and symbols were believed to protect the woman from any harm that would come to her during the birth. This wouldn't really pass a safety inspection in today's hospitals, but back in the 15th century, birthing girdles were all the rage because there wasn't much else they could do. 
for the first time, scientists have actually found one that was in good shape. According to Catherine Rudy with the University of St. Andrews, the birthing girl came from 15th century England and was discovered with traces of birthing fluid and blood on it, suggesting the woman was still wearing it while pushing out her baby. But what kinds of things would be written on the birthing girdle? It would be scrawled with the names of apostles and saints, and it would have pleased to God for the woman not to be injured during childbirth. In other words, it was a medieval lucky charm. Head in a cave. Inside of an Italian cave, a single skull has been discovered miles away from its original burial site. According to Maria Giovanna Belcastro with the University of Bologna, the head was separated from its body, taken away by flowing water, and then lost deep down inside of the cave. It was originally discovered in 2015, deep in a gypsum cave called Marcel Lubon's cave. While it's true that some caves were used as burial grounds in ancient Italy, the simple fact that no other human bones have been found here confused archaeologists, at least at first. There was nothing except a skull, and even the skull was missing its lower jaw. Based on the structure of the bones, the skull belonged to a woman somewhere between 24 and 35 when she died. The skull dates back to around 3600 BC, over 5,000 years ago during what is known as the Neolithic period. From what researchers can gather, the creepy skull rolled away from its head, probably after being severed during a funeral ritual, got moved by something like a flood, and then was carried all the way to the mouth of the cave, where over the centuries, flowing water pushed it deeper and deeper, until it finally wound up in the bottom. So far, the body has not been found. Sigirilla Located in the mountains of Sri Lanka's central province, Sigirilla sits atop a massive rock column that juts nearly 660 feet into the air from the ground below. Humans have always seemed to really like this rock. Its history of human habitation dates back at least 5,000 years to the Mesolithic period. It's perfect because you can see for miles around, and the rock would have been hard for enemies to access. From the 3rd century BC to the 1st century AD, Buddhist monks and ascetics lived in rock shelters and caves at the site. Ascetics are people who practice severe self-discipline and isolation for religious purposes. According to legend, King Kashyapa I chose the site as his new capital in 477 AD, shortly after forcefully seizing the throne from the previous ruler. He named it Sigiriya, which translates to Lion's Rock. Fearing that the rightful heir, Mogolana, would come after him, Kashyapa I saw the elevated rock as an ideal location. He turned the site into an elaborate city and fortress complete with defensive structures, palaces, and gardens. By the terraced gardens, there was a long corridor with one side covered with frescoes and poetry, and on the other side was the mirror wall. It stretched for 656 feet and was so highly polished that you could see the artwork from the other side reflected on it. The mirror wall is almost still intact and has lasted for 15 centuries, serving as a testament to the engineers and artisans who built the wall. But Mogulana returned to get his revenge, and in 495 AD, he defeated Kashyapa, whose armies abandoned him. He then committed suicide. Mogulana converted Sigiriya into a Buddhist monastery complex, and it also served as the capital for several kingdoms but the site was ultimately abandoned sometime during the 13th or 14th century. After being used briefly as an outpost of the Kingdom of Kandy during the 16th and 17th century, the site was then forgotten. Sigirilla was rediscovered in 1831, and today, you can visit this magical place for yourself. A Rare Castle An ancient Dutch castle found in the Netherlands last year is the oldest of its type ever discovered in the country. Archaeologist Nancy de Jong made the incredible find in May 2020 via a geophysical survey which revealed oddly elevated portions of land. She couldn't believe her luck. The location was at the Oud Harlem Castle complex built around 1248. Nancy was shocked by the discovery because the property had already been surveyed during the 1960s, which is when they found the castle complex. But this was another castle that was buried just a few meters away. The castle was around for about 100 years before it was destroyed during a war. Nothing was done to the site after the castle's destruction, leaving what's left of it in good condition. Measuring 148 feet by 148 feet, it had several halls, towers, stables, and other rooms and outbuildings. The researchers were surprised to find that the structure was a square castle, a type of building which was only thought to be built after 1280, during the rule of Floris V 
30 years after it was constructed under Wilhelm II. Now everyone is getting ready to start digging and search for artifacts. Florida's Lost City Deep in the Everglades in far western Broward County, Florida, sits the remnants of a so-called Lost City that was once home to a large Seminole village. According to legend, 30 to 40 Confederate soldiers sought refuge at the three-acre site after stealing Union gold, only to be killed by the Seminoles. Later on, rumor also had it that the notorious mobster Al Capone manufactured moonshine there during the 1930s. Over the years, archaeologists and state wildlife officials have found an array of artifacts, including items of Native American origin, a canoe, shacks, and an iron kettle that was once used to distill sugarcane into alcohol. Many items are hundreds, even thousands of years old, while others indicate that the site also saw activity during the early 20th century. Seminole Mikosuke Archives Director Patsy West said that the site appears to have been used as a bootlegging facility during the Prohibition era. The iron kettle may have been used by the Seminoles, Al Capone's crew, or both. Everyone was making alcohol in the swamp. Records show that Capone owned a nearby saloon, but that he was the only known organized crime connection there. There may be more to the Lost City's history that nobody knows about, and it's possible that several Native American groups reused the site over time, according to archaeologist Dave Carr. While the Florida State Archives list the Lost City as an archaeological site, there is not much to see there today. It's not marked on any maps, and it's covered in thick, overgrown vegetation. In other words, you have to know precisely what you're looking for to even find it. Mays Howe Situated on the main island of Scotland's Orkney Archipelago, Mays Howe is a Neolithic grave dating back to around 2800 BC. Measuring 115 feet in diameter and 24 feet high, the burial mound is one of Orkney's largest tombs. The mound contains chambers and passages built from massive flagstone slabs weighing as much as 30 tons. During the winter solstice, the rear wall of the central chamber lights up, suggesting that the site's builders practiced a form of spiritualism associated with astronomy. Excavations began in 1861 and soon revealed a series of more than 30 runic inscriptions, representing the world's largest single collection of these types of carvings. They date back to the 12th century, when famous Vikings looted the site. Some archaeologists believe that the Norse people made second-hand use of Mays Howe, as evidenced by the external wall surrounding the ditch, which was rebuilt during the 9th century, and that they left behind the treasures that were eventually found and taken by looters. Unfortunately, because of the damage done and the items taken, experts are quite limited on what they can learn from what's left of the site today. Nevada Ghost Town While browsing Google Earth recently, a TikToker named Jason Klein came across an array of creepy hooded men in the town of Rhyolite, Nevada. He shared the eerie discovery on social media, which includes street view images of a hooded figure standing over a bicycle, and a circle of them engaging in what appeared to be some type of ritual or ceremony. Situated roughly 120 miles outside Las Vegas in Nye County, Rhyolite was established in the early 20th century as a mining camp for fortune seekers, who flocked to the nearby Bullfrog Mining District in hopes of striking it big. Residents fled when nervous investors caused the Montgomery Shoshone Mine Company's stock value to plummet in 1911. Rhyolite's population declined to less than 1,000, and within a decade, it was close to zero. Klein's post went viral, and people online were initially baffled by the site. As it turns out, the hooded figures that Klein noticed are a collection of sculptures created by Belgian artist Albert Zukowski. They aren't real people at all. At first glance, it's easy to mistake them for real people, and either way, their presence in the ghost town is a little unsettling. A Monument Hidden in Plain Sight Archaeologists recently identified an ancient structure hidden in plain sight at the Maya city-state of Tikal in northern Guatemala's lowlands, thanks to sophisticated technology that enables researchers to see through thick vegetation and centuries worth of accumulated soil. Using laser scanning equipment called LIDAR, they were able to identify a distinct collection of buildings, including a pyramid, that are unlike anything else they've seen at Tikal. The structures appear to be a smaller-scale replica of the Citadel, an enormous square of architecture at Teotihuacan, located over 800 miles to the west in modern-day Mexico City. As part of the South Tikal archaeological project, a team led by director Edwin Roman Ramirez physically explored the site, where they discovered burials, architecture, and artifacts, 
including ceramics and weapons resembling those found at Teotihuacan. The groundbreaking discovery shows the extent of the distant capital's influence and relationship with Tikal, and reflects a melting pot of cultures and languages, much like we see in some of today's major cities, according to geographer Thomas Garrison, who spoke with National Geographic. The newly identified buildings are not definitive proof that people from Teotihuacan lived at Tikal, but that a group of people who were familiar with the culture lived there for over a century in their own established colony. While an isotopic analysis of bones found at the site should provide more insight into the settlement's history, researchers believe that it was built sometime before the 3rd century. In 378, Teotihuacan's ruler had Tikal's king overthrown and installed his son as the new emperor. Experts are unsure what sparked the falling out between the two societies, who had been allies for several decades. But the recently discovered remains of elite Maya residents who were slaughtered at Teotihuacan, along with destroyed Maya murals, suggest that a culture clash was at play. Rishat Structure Nicknamed the Eye of the Sahara, the Rishat Structure is an eroded geological dome located in the Adrar Plateau in the northwest African nation of Mauritania. Measuring 25 miles in diameter, it exposes layers of igneous and sedimentary rock arranged in concentric circles. The rocks exposed toward the center of the bullseye formation are older than those on the outside, according to NASA, and layers that were once connected have been separated by shifting visible faults. Because the Rishat structure is visible from space, early astronauts used it as a geographical landmark while passing over the Sahara. Most of Mauritania's population of 3.7 million lives about 300 miles from the Rishat structure along the Atlantic coastline and the remote geological oddities' origins have long been a topic of debate. Scientists originally believed it was an impact crater of some sort, perhaps created by a space object that crashed into the Earth. Research conducted during the 1950s and 60s indicated, however, that the Rishat structure was formed by terrestrial processes. A 2011 study concluded that low-temperature hydrothermal waters were responsible for the site's formation. However, it looks like early humans used this place. Artifacts found along the structure's outermost depression were determined to be of pre-Achulean and Achulean origin, meaning that they consist of simple hand tools associated with our early hominid relative, Homo erectus. Scientists don't know much about the Rishat structure or its history of human use, and more exploration is needed to untangle the burning questions surrounding exactly what it is, how it formed, and its significance to our ancestors. Coral Castle Made from over 1,000 tons of sedimentary rock, Coral Castle can be found in Miami-Dade County, Florida. It consists of slab walls, tables, chairs, a crescent moon, a water fountain, and a sundial all made from oolite limestone. Legend holds that a man named Edward Leed Scalnan single-handedly built the site using reverse magnetism, or supernatural abilities, until his death in 1951. Lead Skalnan supposedly constructed Coral Castle after his young lover abandoned him, leaving him heartbroken. He was a small man, weighing 100 pounds and measuring 5 feet tall, so a lot of people wonder how did he build this by himself? An information sheet that hangs at Coral Castle describes it as an engineering marvel and scientifically inexplicable. Furthermore, Coral Castle's website claims that the site has baffled scientists, engineers, and scholars since its opening in 1923. Live Science reports that for decades the park featured a perfectly balanced stone gate that, despite its weight, would easily swing open with a strong breeze or the push of a finger. Nobody knew how it worked until it stopped moving and someone went to fix it. When the gate was removed, it was revealed that it rotated on a metal shaft and rested on a truck bearing. Lead Scalnan was creative and loved to use all kinds of tools, pulleys, tripods, and who knows what else to make his creations come to life but some believe he whispered to the stones to make them move, or that he had psychic powers. While the place is magical, with modern equipment and an entire crew, you could probably replicate the place in a few months. So it's not surprising, after all, that Leeds Skelnan built it all on his own. Orville Irwin, a contractor and longtime friend of Leeds Skelnan, even wrote a book describing exactly how Coral Castle was built, dismissing the many bizarre theories of the site being the product of superpowers. In Irwin's words, Leed Scalanen's was a generation who knew accomplishments by the sweat of their brow. Hard work and imagination made it happen. Uluru 
Also known as Ayers Rock, Uluru is a large isolated sandstone formation in the southern part of Australia's Northern Territory. This remote rock lies 208 miles from the nearest large town of Alice Springs and is surrounded by watering holes, rock caves, and ancient artwork. At 1,142 feet high and with a 5.8-mile perimeter and a reputation for glowing red at dawn and at sunset, it is quite the sight to behold. Uluru is sacred to the area's Aboriginal Anangu people and is one of Australia's most important indigenous sites. To scientists, it's a fascinating geological feature known as an Inselberg, or an island mountain. Inselbergs are usually found in dry, flat regions and are characterized by an isolated knob or a hill that juts out from the land below it. The massive formation originally started out as sand, which condensed to form a type of sandstone called arcos. The layers of sand were deposited horizontally, most likely during the Paleozoic Age between 300 and 400 million years ago, and eventually turned nearly vertical during a later episode of mountain building. Uluru was once home to 46 known native mammal species, but now consists of just 21, including seven bat populations. There are six invasive creatures at the site, including mice, camels, foxes, cats, dogs, and rabbits. Activists are campaigning for the reintroduction of locally extinct animals, such as the rufous hair wallaby, the bilby, mallyfowl, common brush-tailed possum, burrowing batong, and black-flanked rock wallaby. There are many aboriginal myths and legends tied to Uluru, including stories of creation about the area still being inhabited by ancestral spiritual beings. Another tale claims that two boys who were playing in the mud after a rainfall began to fight, and their bodies were preserved as large boulders. In one account, serpent beings engage in harsh warfare around Uluru, resulting in the scarring of the rock that is visible today in the forms of cracks and crevices. These are just some of the legends surrounding Uluru, where visitors are cautioned against taking rocks or other souvenirs at the risk of becoming cursed and suffering misfortune. In the past, people have even mailed back mementos they took from the site in hopes of shaking their bad luck. Thanks for watching! Do you believe in cursed objects? If you took something, would you give it back? Let me know in the comments below, and remember to subscribe if you haven't already. See you next time! Bye!